Hello, I'm Michelle Doherty. I work at Imperial College in the physics department here. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is involvement that we have in the Cassini spacecraft mission, which is orbiting around Saturn. Um, I'm a little bit jet lagged because I was out in Los Angeles earlier this week. So I think I'm OK. I'm beginning to wake up. But I've got lots of coffees on board as well. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to lower the lights just a, li a little bit at the front so that you can see the slides a little bit better. Is that OK? More. More. <laughs> I might fall asleep, though, you know. <laughs> better? OK. OK, so um, this shows you a view that the Cassini spacecraft took of Saturn over a period of about 63 hours. And so it was lots of different images that it took with the sun behind Saturn. And it essentially put them all together. And so there are some things that you can see on a number of occasions which are essentially the same thing. So let's have a look. I can't see the screen very well. You can see this plume which turns out to be water vapor on a number of different occasions. You can see it here a little bit as well, and that's because of the fact that we've put together lots of different images. Um, the other thing I really love about this view is that's the Earth. <laughs> and so you can essentially, by looking at Saturn, you can see the Earth way in the distance. Now, Saturn is a gas giant. And so that, that edge of the surface that you're seeing isn't a solid surface, but it's gas. And as we get deeper and deeper into the interior, we think it becomes liquid and then solid right at the interior. And then the moons that you can see, they're made up of countless individual particles, each in their own orbit around Saturn. And one of the focuses of the end of the mission, which I'm going to talk a bit about right at the end of the talk, is trying to understand better the rings. So... Just to give you an idea of the involvement in the Cassini spacecraft mission, um, there are scientists and engineers from all around the world that are involved. Um, I've got team members in, from the UK, from Europe, and from the States. And the instrument that I'm responsible for is the magnetometer instrument. And what that does is it measures the magnetic field in the vicinity of the spacecraft. But we want to make sure we don't measure the magnetic field of the spacecraft. We want to measure the field in the environment. And so what we do is we put ourselves on this very long boom to try and get ourselves as far away from the spacecraft as we can. And to begin with, the instrument consisted of two different instruments, one which was halfway down the boom here and one which was right at the end of the boom. A year after we got into orbit at Saturn, though, the one at the end of the boom, which was built in the States, stopped working. And so that made it really difficult for us to calibrate our instrument. One of the things we need to be able to do is know where the zero level of the instrument is. And that changes over time. So without having two working instruments, what we need to do is roll the entire spacecraft to be able to help us do that. And I'm going to show you a little movie at the end where a couple of days ago, as we got really close to Saturn, we rolled the spacecraft to let us work out um, what the zero level of the instrument is. The other few things I'd like to point out is this big white umbre umbrella here is known as the high-gain antenna. And the high-gain antenna is the way in which data is sent back down to the Earth. Once a day, for eight hours, the high-gain antenna points at the Earth, and it sends back all the data that the spacecraft and the instruments have taken in the last 24 hours. And you also see there's lots of gold foil covering the spacecraft. That's a thermal blanket. That allows us to keep the spacecraft and the instruments at a temperature that they can operate safely in. Because out at Saturn, it's about minus 170 degrees Celsius. So we need to try and keep the instruments as warm as we can. So I'd like to show this slide because it essentially shows you how large the spacecraft is. So this is a view of the spacecraft before launch in a test chamber, where essentially we tested both the spacecraft and the instruments to see whether they could work in the vacuum, that is outer space, but also work in the extremes of temperatures that we were going to see. For us to be able to get out to Saturn, we needed to fly past some of the other planets in the solar system to get a bit of an energy boost. And so we went in and flew past Venus twice, and there the temperature is about 100 degrees Celsius. Out at Saturn, it's minus 170 degrees. And so we, need, we needed to make sure that the instruments and the spacecraft could actually operate in those temperatures. And you can also see people standing 
at the bottom here, so it gives you an understanding about how big the spacecraft is. It's about two stories tall. One thing that you might notice is my boom on which I put my instrument is not there. And, and is in fact there, but it's folded away in this canister here. Because if you think about it, you can't launch, launch a spacecraft with a, a, a boom. Well, you could, but you probably lose it as, it as it was launched. And so after it was launched, the boom was actually deployed, and that's when we started taking data. Okay, um, this just gives you a quick overview of the four different areas in which we plan to do science once we got to Saturn. Of course, I'm not going to have time to talk about most of this, but I'll be able to touch on some of it. So now the end of the mission, which I'm going to talk about right at the end of the talk, we're focusing on Saturn. It's trying to understand the interior of Saturn, how old its rings are, and how, and how they formed. Titan is one of the moons of Saturn. This was the moon that has an atmosphere very similar to what the Earth's atmosphere was like when it first formed. And in fact, I have a video right at the end that shows you the European Space Agency probe called Huygens, which traveled down through the atmosphere of Titan and landed on the surface. Um, some of the other moons, there are about 63 moons at Saturn. Every time we look, we see a few more. Um, but I'm going to describe the discovery that my team made of a, of, a, of a water vapor plume coming off from the south pole of one of the moons called Enceladus. And then this here is called the magnetosphere. It's essentially the big cavity that forms around Saturn and is protected from energetic solar wind. Okay, to be able to talk about the magnetic field, you need to have a, a little bit of an understanding about what it is. Now, if, if you think about it, if you, if you had a, a compass the, no, the needle of the compass would point to the north pole of the Earth's field. And if you could see the magnetic field of the Earth, that's what it would actually look like. Another way of thinking about it is if you had a piece of paper and a bar magnet underneath the piece of paper, and you put iron filings on top of the paper, those iron filings would lie along the lines of force, and that's what they'd look like, those red lines there. And so exactly the same thing happens at Saturn. And what happens is as Saturn and the Earth in that picture rotates or orbits on its axis, the magnetic field lines are going to orbit as well. And so if I'm a moon, if you guys are Saturn and you're rotating on your axis, and I'm a moon somewhere close to Saturn, those red field lines are going to be moving past me once every 10 and a half hours. And so you need to keep that in mind when I show you one of the discoveries that we made. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the rings. Um, well, this, th this essentially gives you a, a view of the entire Saturn system. And so you can see the planet itself, you can see the visible rings, and yet then you can see the orbit of some of the moons. So Enceladus is the one, that one there. That's the one that I'm going to focus on. Um, and one of the things that we knew before Cassini flew past Enceladus was that its surface was very young, but also that it seemed to be made up mainly of water ice. The other thing we knew was that the E-ring, which you can't see with the naked eye, but you can measure if you fly, if you fly through it, the E-ring starts just where the orbit of Enceladus is, and it goes way off to the outer regions of the system. And all the material in the E-ring is water ice. And so people have always wondered is Enceladus somehow a source of the E-ring, but no one quite understood how that could be the case. And so what happened is we, we reached Saturn in July 2004, and we had um, two flybys of Enceladus in early 2005. And this is a view from one of the flybys, and this is a, these are two images that were taken by the camera on board Cassini just to essentially show you the surface. And you can clearly see that there aren't many craters. You know, you can count a few. But if you compare the surface of Enceladus to Mimas, let me go back. Mimas is a moon which orbits around Saturn just inside of Enceladus. The surface of Mimas is covered in lots and lots of different craters. And you would expect the same to happen at Enceladus because it's so close by. And so the implication is that something is going on at Enceladus which is making its surface much younger. Hardly any craters at all, but they're these, these large cracks on the surface. The other thing um, that 
we knew, and I touched on it earlier, is from the Voyager spacecraft that flew past Saturn in the late 80s, we knew that the surface is made up of water ice. And so there were actually three flybys of the Cassini spacecraft past Enceladus in 2005. One was a distant flyby. Let me just, the size of Enceladus is quite small. Its diameter is about 500 kilometers. So it's, you would have expected that its interior had long cooled down from when it first formed. Um, so we had the first flyby, which was rather far, rather far away, just under 1,300 kilometers. We saw some interesting stuff in the data, but we weren't quite sure if we could believe it because the spacecraft was moving very quickly as it flew by so that the camera could keep Enceladus in view. And so we weren't sure if we were getting the spacecraft movement quite right. But a month later, we had a second flyby, which was a little bit closer. And we saw the same signature in our data. It was as if Enceladus was much bigger than it seemed to look. Something was stopping the magnetic field lines of Saturn from penetrating down to the surface of Enceladus. And one of the things that will do that is an atmosphere. Just like at the Earth, the upper regions of the atmosphere become ionized because of solar radiation. And that ionized region doesn't allow the magnetic field lines from the sun to penetrate through. And so that was the idea that we had in mind. And so what I did is I went out to the Jet Propulsion Lab and I told them what we thought we were seeing. And I made the case for us to go much closer on the third flyby. The third flyby was, I think, four months later. And it was due to be about 1,000 kilometers above the surface. But based on the observations we made on the first two flybys, I, I was sure we were seeing something. So I managed to persuade the project to take us really close, 173 kilometers above the surface. And what I did is I showed them this schematic just to try and give them an understanding about what we thought we were seeing. So what we have is you guys are looking down on the North Pole of Saturn. And so there's the North Pole of Saturn. Those green rings are the rings. The blue lines are the magnetic field lines of Saturn that are rotating at the same rate that Saturn is. And the little orange ball is Enceladus, which is orbiting around Saturn. If Enceladus was a dead body, those blue lines, the magnetic field lines, would move straight through it, would, wouldn't see it at all. But what we seem to be seeing in the data, now we have a slightly different view, now we're standing sideways on and looking at Enceladus and the field lines moving towards Enceladus. What seemed to be coming out of our data was that instead of the magnetic field lines being able to go straight through Enceladus and not see it at all, they seemed to be held upstream, like there was this obstacle. And that was the atmosphere that we thought we were seeing. So based on that, the Cassini project... Hi, Malin. I was just waiting for the phone to stop. <laughs> um, based on that, the Cassini project took us much closer on the third flyby. And I must confess, I didn't sleep for a couple of nights beforehand. Because if we had seen nothing, no one would ever have believed anything I said again. But <laughs> luckily, we did. And what we saw was actually very different to what we'd seen on the first two flybys. On the first two flybys, based on our data, I thought there was an atmosphere covering the entire surface of Enceladus. But on the third close flyby, which fortuitously came up from below and flew like that, what we found is that there was this, this, this water vapor plume coming off from the South Pole, almost like a cometary jet of water vapor coming from the South Pole. Something I didn't mention, and we'd seen in, in our data on all three of the flybys, there was an increase in wave activity in the data. And you can use the frequency of that wave activity to work out what molecules are being generated. And it was lots of water group ions. So that was another piece of evidence that we thought. And so essentially what seemed to be happening is you had this outgassing of water vapor coming off from the South Pole of the Moon. But because we went so close, all the other instruments on board were able to take useful data as well. And I'm just going to show you some of that. The top left-hand image shows you a camera view of Enceladus. And what you can see are these blue stripes, the South Pole. The camera team called them tiger stripes. I don't know why. They don't look like tiger stripes to me. But once they named them, that was it. Everyone called them tiger stripes. Um, and these tiger stripes, they were, they were, they were really, they seemed to be deep cracks at the South Pole. 
another bit of data was taken by an instrument that is able to remotely sense the temperature of the surface. And if you think about it, you would expect the equatorial regions to be hottest because that's where the solar radiation is strongest. And so that's what they expected to see. Now, when I say hot, uh, we're talking about 80 degrees Kelvin, which is about minus 120 degrees Celsius. But out at those distances, that's quite hot. Um, so what, what they saw instead was, yes, it seemed to be warmer at the equator, but there was this real hot spot right at the South Pole. And if you overlay this temperature data on the image, the hottest region, 91 degrees Kelvin, was lying right over one of the cracks on the surface. And so the implication is that there was internal heat leaking out from the surface of Enceladus, which is a real surprise because, as I mentioned earlier on, Enceladus is really small. You would have thought that, you know, when it first formed, there would have been heat in the interior, but over time that heat would decay away. But what seems to be happening at Enceladus is you've got this heat source in the interior which is somehow making water liquid, and that liquid water is escaping as water vapor gas from the moon. But not only did we find water vapor, we found dust as well. And we also found lots of other stuff. This is data from an instrument which is almost, is almost able to taste the plume. We actually, I'll sh at, in the video at the end, I'll, I'll show you a really close flyby that we had through the plume, about 25 kilometers above the surface. And it's able to taste what's in the plume. And it found lots of different things. Water vapor was the, the most of the material, but there was methane, there was carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, and then there was simple and organic and complex organic material as well. And so people got really excited because if you think about it, one of the, thing, one of the reasons that we go out to explore is we're trying to work out if there is somewhere else in the solar system and beyond where life might form. You need four things. You need liquid water. You need organic material. You need a heat source. And the fourth thing, and that's what we're not sure about at Enceladus, is you need those three things to be stable over time. And so people have become really excited about Enceladus potentially having the conditions that you need for life to form. And so as a result of, of these three flybys, in the rest of the Cassini mission, we've had another 21 flybys of Enceladus. We understand it much better, but you only can really understand a planetary body so far away if you go into orbit around it. And so people are hoping to be able to go back to Enceladus. So in the last... Ten minutes or so, what I'd like to do is focus on the end of the mission. Um, we were launched in 1997. We were due to orbit around Saturn for four years, but because the spacecraft has survived so well and the instruments have as well, and the science we're getting is still great, the missions have been extended for many years. We're now in our 13th year of orbiting around Saturn, and we're running out of fuel. We're now on the fumes. Um, I hope we're going to get to the end of the mission because what we're planning to do is great, but I must confess, I don't know if my nerves can take it. Um, we've got 22 really close flybys of Saturn. We're going to go inside of the ring. So let me show you. This shows you a, a schematic of what we're doing. So let's just orient ourselves. So we, we, we've, got Sat we've got Saturn here, of course. We've got the Earth way off to the left. The Earth is 10 astronomical units away, which means it takes 80 minutes for a command from us to get to Saturn and another 80 minutes for us to hear if it's taken it on board. So you need lots of patience. Um, this is the orbit of Titan, which is at about 20 planetary radii away from Saturn. And for the end of the mission, we started off with what were called ring grazing orbits, where the closest approach to Saturn was just beyond the edge of the F ring. And so we've been able to take beautiful images of the F ring. We've also been able to take data on magnetic field lines above the poles of the planet, and that's going to help us understand the data we're now taking. But we're now in the end phase. It lasts four and a half months. Um, and we're doing these, what they call grand finale orbits, where the closest approach is just above the surface of the atmosphere. Um, and we had to actually be really careful on the first close orbit. We traveled with the high-gain antenna pointing in the direction of travel 
just in case they were energetic dust particles that might have hit the spacecraft. And so we were really quite concerned um, that we were going to survive the first one. Um, I have to get more used to this because every six and a half days I can't keep the stress levels up. Um, but that's a close-up view. So what we're doing is beforehand we were told there was this gap between the rings. But you're never quite sure if it's actually an empty gap or not until you fly through it. But it turns out it is. One of the things we found on that first close flyby is there were hardly any dust particles at all, and so they're now calling it the big empty. I do hope it stays big and empty right until the end of the mission. Now, the reason we're doing this is when Cassini runs out of fuel, we want to make sure that we don't crash land on one of the moons where there might be life. Because you don't want to um, take a man-made object to a place in the solar system where there might be life. You want to make sure that it stays clean. And so what we're going to do is we're going to burn up in the atmosphere of Saturn. So we're going to have these 22 very close in orbit. And then on the 22nd orbit, we're going to run out of fuel. We're going to get so close, we're going to start tumbling in the atmosphere. But we're going to do great science as we do that. And this was designed with two of the instruments in mind, in mind, mine and the instrument that measures the gravity. And the reason that we're doing it is that it's quite embarrassing. We've been in orbit around Saturn for 13 years, and we still don't know how long a day on Saturn is. And people say to me, how can you not know? Well, it's complicated. If you think about it, it's a gas giant, so there isn't a, a surface feature that you can follow. Jupiter's the same, but Jupiter, let me, I think the next slide gives you a view. Let me take a step back first. What my instrument does is it measures the magnetic field outside of the planet, and it allows you to work out what's going on inside. And people who work on how planetary magnetic fields operate have said that the only way in which they can be generated is that the rotation axis of the planet and the magnetic axis, there needs to be a tilt between those two. If there isn't, it can't be generated. At Saturn, there isn't any tilt at all. We've been there for 13 years and we can't find one. So planetary dynamo people are saying, your instrument is messed up, you're not measuring it properly, and we're saying, no, our instrument's fine. Um, so we're hoping by really close we can work out what that tilt is. But we need to use that tilt to help us work out how long a day on Saturn is. That's what we do at Jupiter. Jupiter has a gas surface as well. And I, I mean, I know there are features in the atmosphere, but they don't all rotate at the same rate. So we use the tilt at Jupiter to work out that its day is 9.6 hours long. At Saturn, it's about 10 and a half hours. But so far in our data, we see all these strange waves in the data, which are different depending on whether you're looking in the northern atmosphere or the southern atmosphere, and they change with season. If you look at it in summer or winter, they're different as well. So clearly what we're seeing is not the interior. It's things going on in the atmosphere. So that's why we're doing this. And hopefully what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to get an understanding about really what's going on inside. Because for a magnetic field to be generated inside, you need current to, to flow. And what we think is happening at Saturn is it's made up mainly of, mainly of hydrogen. We think that somehow the electrons are being stripped off the hydrogen, and that allows current to flow in the interior. But we need to be able to measure the internal planetary field before we can work that out. So the next slide is lots of words. It was just to remind you, or to remind me, to tell you, that the spacecraft and the instruments were not designed to do this. And I'm trying to keep my team members' expectations down as to whether we're going to be able to do it or not. For example, calibrating the instrument to make sure where we know where the zero level is. When we're close to Saturn, we're in a measuring range that we haven't been in for 18 years. So we need to be able to calibrate the data before we can work out what's going on. And so we've now got two close flybys. The data is beautiful, but I don't trust it because it's not calibrated yet. So we need to wait for all the calibration roles before we can actually work out what, what is actually going on. So that was 
an artist's impression of what they thought the view would be like for anyone following on behind Saturn on its first closest approach inside. And as I mentioned to you, we traveled with the high gain antenna pointing in the direction of travel to protect us from any energetic dust particles. That was fine for everyone else. My instruments on this long boom, we weren't protected for a second. And I was a little bit nervous and I thought, no, you're being stupid. And then I, I was out at the Jet Propulsion Lab last week when the first flyby happened and uh, I bumped into the project manager who's responsible for the entire project and also the, manager, the person who's responsible for the safety of the spacecraft. And they both came up to me separately and said, we're really nervous for you, you know. <laughs> and I said, oh, thanks a lot. They said, well, we want you to be as uptight as we are. So I sat there for three hours biting my nails to the quick. But we survived, and we also survived the second flyby, which happened on Tuesday, which was really critical for us, because that's when the entire spacecraft was rotating. It rotated for 18 hours so that we can actually calibrate. And I think I have a movie, a very short movie. I've got a, a much longer one after this, but this actually shows you the spacecraft rotating as it went through closest approach. No? Oh, sorry. There you go. So for 18 hours, it rotated as fast as they would allow it. Not very fast at all. I think it went through a rotation in about half an hour or so. Um, and by doing that, it's given us data that's going to allow us to back out what the zero level of the instrument is. But to be able to do it properly, if you think about it, when you measure the magnetic field, you measure a vector. So you need three different directions. And if you roll in one direction, you're only going to get two. And so on the third close flyby, which is Tuesday of next week, I can tell, tell it to you down to the second because I'm worried about it, we're going to rotate around one of the other axes. And then we will have the data that we need to calibrate. And then I've told my body that I'm going to calm down. I don't know whether it'll listen, but... So let me end by showing you a video which was put together by the Jet Propulsion Lab, which essentially gives you a history of the mission, but it also details what we're doing at the moment, too. And there's sound as well. A lone explorer. On a mission to reveal the grandeur of Saturn, its rings and moons. After 20 years in space, NASA's Cassini spacecraft is running out of fuel. And so, to protect moons of Saturn that could have conditions suitable for life, a spectacular end has been planned for this long-lived traveler from Earth. In 2004, following a seven-year journey through the solar system, Cassini arrived at Saturn. The SOI burn attitude or pointing position and light up the rockets. The spacecraft carried a passenger, the European Huygens probe, the first human-made object to land on a world in the distant outer solar system. For over a decade, Cassini has shared the wonders of Saturn and its family of icy moons, taking us to astounding worlds where methane rivers run to a methane sea, where jets of ice and gas are blasting material into space from a liquid water ocean that might harbor the ingredients for life. And Saturn a giant world ruled by raging storms and delicate harmonies of gravity. Now, Cassini has one last daring assignment. Cassini's grand finale is a brand new adventure. 
22 dives through the space between Saturn and its rings. As it repeatedly braves this unexplored region, Cassini seeks new insights about the origins of the rings and the nature of the planet's interior, closer to Saturn than ever before. On the final orbit, Cassini will plunge into Saturn, fighting to keep its antenna pointed at Earth as it transmits its farewell. In the skies of Saturn, the journey ends as Cassini becomes part of the planet itself. So that's it. Thank you very much.